Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Crowdwise Academy, where we give you the skills and knowledge required to get started in early stage investing through equity crowdfunding. Today, we're going to be wrapping up our level one fast track novice courses with modern portfolio theory. And then we'll be giving you your final capstone assignment to really solidify all the knowledge you've learned throughout these level one courses. As a reminder, Crowdwise Academy, you're part of the novice module two investing fundamentals courses right now. We also have some level two courses as well as level three advanced investor courses. All of these are completely free over at Crowdwise Academy. So if you haven't already, create your free account to get access to them. An overview of what we'll be talking about today. Modern portfolio theory, what the efficient frontier is, how risky assets can actually de-risk a portfolio, and modern portfolio theory, MPT, assumptions and limitations. So, modern portfolio theory was devised by Nobel Prize winner Harry Markowitz in 1952. Basically, what modern portfolio theory is, is that it gives a way to optimize a portfolio to get the maximum returns for the minimum amount of risk. It also stresses the importance of correlation, where it's not all just about risk versus return trade-offs. It's also about how an asset behaves relative to other assets that you hold in your portfolio. One of the key things that came out of modern portfolio theory is called the efficient frontier. All the charts we're going to be showing on the following slides were created from PortfolioVisualizer.com. If you haven't checked this website out already, it's a fantastic resource. It has so many useful tools for portfolio modeling and asset allocation such as efficient frontier analysis, as we'll be showing, asset allocation backtesting, Monte Carlo simulations, asset correlations, market timing analysis, and much, much more. The best part, it's completely free. I get no benefit of sending you over there, but I have found it so useful that I have no doubt that you'll find it useful as well. So let's talk about optimizing risk versus return. If we put in just a two asset portfolio containing the US stock market on one end, and US bond market on the other, we can see that the tool creates all these blue dots going from a basically 100% bond portfolio to a 100% stock market portfolio. This is called the efficient frontier. Now when there's only two assets in your portfolio, the efficient frontier is some combination of those two, basically ranging from 100% stocks, this is around a 60% stock, 40% bonds, and down to 100% bonds and everything in between. As we'll show, when you start adding more than two assets, it starts to get pretty interesting in terms of the risk-reward combinations. One interesting thing that we can get from this chart is that if you zoom in on the bond end. Now normally, if you ask someone what the safest portfolio is to hold, a lot of people may believe that it would be 100% US bonds. However, this isn't entirely true. When you bring correlation into the picture, you can actually see that if you draw a dotted line through US bonds, there's actually, for the similar risk, other portfolios that can give you a higher return. Furthermore, even for a very small percent of stocks, there are perhaps some portfolios that have a lower risk while giving you a higher return. This is an example of how adding riskier assets to a portfolio can actually de-risk your overall investment portfolio. And it's counterintuitive to a lot of people. However, some of these same principles apply when we're adding alternative investments, such as startups in our case, to our portfolios. So let's take another look at the efficient frontier. In modern portfolio theory, the efficient frontier is basically the set of portfolios that optimize returns at a given level of risk. Let's go back to our example before, but add a couple more assets in. Now we've added REITs, real estate investment trusts, and gold, as well as having our total US bond market and US stock market. Now, you can see that the efficient frontier depicted by the blue line has actually shifted a little. No longer does it go through the US stock market directly, since actually adding in a small portion of REIT and gold to the mix can shift the curve, so to speak, to give you more efficient portfolio allocations. In this case, instead of holding 100% US stocks, you could actually get, for the same risk, a higher return by adding some REITs. Similarly, for a lower level of risk, if you draw a line to the left, you can see that you can get similar returns for a lower level of risk by adding some of these assets and mixing it in your overall portfolio. This is the power of what modern portfolio theory teaches us and how asset allocation becomes important for your overall investments. So we talked about shifting in the efficient frontier. 
And we accomplish that by adding new investments or asset classes that have different risk, reward, and correlation profiles than the existing assets in our portfolio. Let's go through another example. Here, we've depicted portfolios ranging from 100% stocks, represented by the S&P 500 with dividends, to 100% bonds, represented by the 10-year T-bond. We ran this analysis for data from 1928 to 2018. Now, let's assume we're adding a non-correlated, different risk, different reward profile asset to this portfolio. Theoretically, what that should do is take the old efficient frontier, represented by the blue dotted line here, and shift it up to the green line. Now, this is for illustration purposes only. The green curve is not based on actual data, but based on the theory of modern portfolio theory, what we can now see is that for a given portfolio that was on the efficient frontier in the stock bond portfolio, let's choose a 70% stock, 30% bond, there are now two new solutions that give us optimized risk-adjusted returns. First, going up at the same risk level represented by standard deviation, we can see that we can get a higher return for the same risk by adding this alternative asset to our portfolio. If we wanted to decrease our risk, we can see how that by going to the left and having the exact same return, we can actually decrease our risk by adding this asset. This is the potential and theoretical benefit of adding startups and other non-correlated alternative assets to a traditional investment portfolio. So let's go back to the four asset example. Here we have gold, stocks, REITs, and bonds again. Let's assume a portfolio of 30% stocks, 10% REIT, 10% bonds, and 50% gold. Do you think that's the optimal portfolio with those assets? Well, as we can see from the historical analysis, from data ranging from 1994 to 2019, we can see that the provided portfolio represented in red here is actually within the efficient frontier. Thus, there are better risk-adjusted solutions if we wanted to optimize this portfolio. As you can see, if you go to the left, a portfolio that consisted perhaps of 34% stocks, 14% REITs, 3.6% gold, and 48% bonds would have a better risk return ratio. The sharp ratio is one measure of risk adjusted returns. I'll show you quickly what this looks like on the website. If we minimize and we take a look at the efficient frontier, here's the page on Portfolio Visualizer. If you go to Tools and then Historical Efficient Frontier, that will bring up this page. We chose data since data for REITs was only available starting in 1994, and then you put in whatever allocations you want, and you can also assign minimum and maximum weights for the simulation. It then does some calculations to optimize a portfolio. It calculates a tangency portfolio, which is indicated in the diagram below, and then you can take a look at your plots. As we've shown, our provided portfolio, having 50% gold, is not the most efficient combination of all these assets based on historical data. Thus, you can take a look by going up the curve what that blend would look like, or you can go to the left of the curve and see which combinations have a lower risk at a similar return. Overall, you can use this tool to tweak and refine your portfolio and allocation, and it's a great way to start to get a feel for how startups and other alternative assets can be in addition to your portfolio. So when investors talk about alternative investments, one intent of adding these non-correlated alternative investments to a portfolio is to get this shift in that risk reward curve for that portfolio, which improves your risk first return possibilities. Early stage investors, as well as growth and later stage investors, believe that by adding a small amount of the private startup asset class to an investment portfolio can achieve this goal of shifting that curve, making more efficient combinations possible within portfolios. Remember, you still shouldn't be investing too much because of the risk of startups, and you need to make sure to diversify among the startups you do invest in. Many angels and other private market investors recommend around a 5-10% to allocation for your total private market investments in high-risk startups. As with anything, though, modern portfolio theory is only a tool, and so here are some assumptions and limitations to keep in mind when applying this to startups. First, modern portfolio theory assumes an efficient market. The reality, and many people will argue, is that even the public markets are not always perfectly efficient, but especially in the private markets that are less liquid, have less information, and less participants, it's probably a reality that the market is not going to be perfectly efficient all the time. Second, another assumption of MPT is that investors are rational and avoid risk. The reality is, while many investors try to be rational, 
Human emotions and behavior, as we saw, can often get the best of you. And so the reality is that investors are not always going to be rational, and further, they won't always be looking to avoid risk. Third assumption is that investors attempt to maximize economic returns. The reality, and again, especially in startups, is that that's not always true. Think of impact investors, or those supporting founders that they believe in, or perhaps businesses they want to see in their community. These investors are investing for reasons that are not purely monetary in nature. Thus, this assumption does not always hold true in the startup world. Also, modern portfolio theory makes an assumption that returns are normally distributed random values. The reality, as we'll show in some of our more advanced courses, is that startups are generally believed to be power law distributions. Thus, not all of these assumptions hold true for modern portfolio theory. The key takeaway here for you and for investors everywhere is that modern portfolio theory is a tool that can be used. Remember the saying, the map is not the territory. While it's something that you can use to help you in creating your portfolio, you need to adjust it over time and in response to changing market conditions and changing regulations. Your assignment for today will be to complete your one-page startup investing plan. Finish watching the final level one lecture where we will go over the capstone project. Complete this one page startup investing plan prior to going on to level two. I've been in your shoes. I know how exciting this all is and how much you want to get in and make your first investment. However, I can't stress how important it is and how helpful it will be to both solidify your knowledge and help set up a great foundation for your future investments to just take the 10 minutes and do this one one page startup plan. Then, pat yourself on the back because level one is complete. As always, please leave us some comments in the comment section below. And for feedback, or even just to say hi, send me an email, brian at crowdwise.org. If you found this level one course helpful, please do feel free to share it with friends and other investors that may be interested or may be able to benefit from some of this knowledge. We'll see you back here for the level one capstone overview, and then we'll wrap up level one.